Hey everybody, welcome back to an all new episode of 10 to Life with me, Annie Elise. I hope you guys are having a good start to your day today. I feel like I'm probably about to ruin it with this case, but that's what we're here to do. We're here to talk true crime with each other so we can all kind of just be in that uncomfy, pissed off bucket together right? So today's case is one that it truly is the epitome of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. I mean, as true crime watchers, we can be pretty paranoid and even safety conscious in our everyday lives. I know that I am. We teach ourselves what to do in multiple kinds of situations, but I think that we all know that when it comes down to it, there are sometimes some things that we just can't prepare for. Now, it's also interesting because we'll see in this case that the technology that we had in 2008 was so far from what we've gotten used to today. In fact, this case wasn't solved until recently because of just how lacking the technology really was. So guys, let's jump right in. Alright guys, let's keep it real for a second. Getting in debt can be super easy, but getting out? Well, I feel like the system is set up so that we don't, and the anxiety, the stress of it all, it can be soul crushing. I get all of that. And I'm here to say that you don't have to go at it alone. There is a way out. Help is available all thanks to PDS Debt. PDS Debt has customized options for anybody struggling with credit cards, personal loans, collections, or even medical bills. They truly care about getting you out of debt. PDS Debt rolls all of your monthly payments into one low, interest-free monthly payment. So if it feels like you're making payments every month on your debt and your balances just, they're not going down, this program is for you. Everyone with $10,000 or more in eligible debt qualifies and there's no minimum credit score required. Bad and fair credit is accepted. PDS Debt is also a top rated company on Google and they have an A plus rating on the Better Business Bureau. So save thousands in interest and fees and pay off your debt in a fraction of the time. PDS Debt is also offering a free debt analysis. It only takes 30 seconds and all you have to do is head over to pdsdebt.com slash 10 to life to get your free debt assessment today. That's pdsdebt.com slash 10 to life to get your free debt assessment today. In 2008, 21-year-old Brittany Zimmerman was living her dream college life. Before that, she was the typical small-town girl in Wisconsin who just had these huge, mega, big dreams. And by the time she graduated from high school in 2005, she was already well on her way to accomplishing those goals. She had been working with her guidance counselor since freshman year to map out what her future was going to look like, and she really hoped that one day she could really make an impact and she could help people. Now, Brittany's long-term goal was to become a doctor, and while she knew that that path would be very long, would be very difficult, very tedious, she was up for the challenge. She was super interested in diseases, and specifically, she was interested in lung diseases. And her dream job, it was to work at the Center for Disease Control in Hawaii. But getting into good colleges and even good med schools, it takes more than just making plans, right? So throughout high school, Brittany kept herself pretty busy with all sorts of different extracurricular activities, and this is what helped set her apart from all of the rest of the applicants. She was part of the Spanish Club, the school band, National Honor Society, and on top of all of that, she also still always made time to do volunteer work at the American Cancer Society Hope Lodge. She knew that to get where she wanted to go in her life, she was going to have to work hard for it. So after graduating from high school, Brittany went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which was a little over two hours away from where she had grown up in Marshfield. She decided to major in immunology and microbiology, and she even made the dean list during her first two semesters. I mean, she was a very, very smart cookie. Now, while Brittany was adjusting to the craziness of college life, there was one thing that stayed calm and it stayed consistent, and that was her boyfriend, Jordan Gonerig. They had known each other pretty much all of their lives, and they officially began dating in high school. 
They were always pretty serious about their relationship, too, so Jordan ended up transferring to the same college so that he could be closer to Brittany. And then, the two of them ended up getting an apartment together. It was in the downtown area of Madison, and it was really just the perfect setup for two college students, because it was off campus, so it gave them a little bit more privacy and freedom, but it was also close enough for an easy commute to school. Now, speaking of the apartment and safety, Brittany was always pretty safety conscious. She would always keep all the doors and windows locked, and she was always aware of all of her surroundings. And the area that she and Jordan were living in wasn't necessarily bad, but there was quite a bit of trouble with the homeless population. They were both well aware of the risks of the crime in the area, though, so they always locked their cars, they locked their front door, they locked their windows, everything. Again, it's not that that area was awful, but it was something that they had to be aware of, which I feel is pretty standard when you live in any bigger city. So Brittany made every single effort she could to be mindful of safety, but also at the same time, she didn't want to sacrifice her life and she wanted to live life to the fullest. And when I say live her life to the fullest, she was about as busy as anybody could be. She was an active student with a very difficult major, she had lots of exciting things going on, and she was also working a job. On top of all of that, Jordan had proposed, and they started planning their absolute dream wedding in Hawaii. Now, we all know that not everyone can afford the luxury of going to college and not having a job while you're there. You usually tend to need both. I mean, I know I did. I think if you're able to do that, you're definitely one of the lucky ones. But whether Brittany simply couldn't afford not to work or just chose to work because she wanted to, I'm not exactly sure. But she did end up getting a job on campus working in the register's office. During her time there, she stood out to both her coworkers and her boss, and it was because of her truly strong work ethic. It never seemed like she was just there for the paycheck, which obviously to some degree, everybody is at a job there for the paycheck, but she always went above and beyond in everything that she did, and she also truly enjoyed it. Her job was to document student records and to keep them organized by scanning and then filing them away. It was a pretty tedious job and not something that a lot of people enjoyed but Brittany always had a smile on her face, and she never complained. She even came up with a completely new system of organizing the documents, which again was greatly appreciated since you don't see a whole lot of people going above and beyond like that at their jobs. Now, something that everyone always has said about Brittany was that she was an extremely positive person and that she always approached everything with a glass half full type of optimism and attitude. So when she learned how long and difficult it would be to be pre-med, she just kind of let it roll off her shoulders, and she believed in herself that she was just going to figure it out. She also knew that she wanted to get married to Jordan and one day have children with him. She also knew that her education would make things a little bit more complex in the short term, but she never worried too much about it, and she never put that negative energy out there. Instead, she just trusted herself, and she trusted that if there was something that she wanted, she was going to make it happen. So in the spring of 2008, Brittany decided to take a semester off of work because of how difficult and time-consuming her classes were at the time. Even after learning about her drive and her work ethic, I can only imagine how difficult the classes were. If even she was like, yeah, I can't do all of this. It was a big loss for the office where she worked, but it was more important for her to get through school. That spring, she had been attending all of her classes and working hard to stay on top of everything. It had been a difficult semester, but as April approached, the semester was closer and closer to being over, and everybody was just scrambling to get last-minute studying and assignments finished. That included Brittany and Jordan. On April 2nd, 2008, Brittany had gone to campus for her morning class that ended at 11.30 a.m. She and a friend stayed afterward to talk to the professor, trying to get some help on final papers and exams before leaving the building. Once they were then outside, Jordan had yelled down from a nearby balcony when he saw Brittany and her friend, and then he called her on her cell to catch up. After they chatted, Brittany decided that she was going to head back to the apartment to study. On her way home, at 11.57 a.m., she tried calling her mom, but her mom didn't answer. Once she got home, she immediately logged onto her computer. But she was only on the computer from about 12 to 12.18 p.m., so that doesn't seem like a very long time to study or get anything productive done, right? And that's because something had stopped her. Something happened that made her put everything on hold, though she had no idea just how bad things were about to get. One minute later, at 12.19 p.m., a call came in to 911, but nobody seemed to be on the other end of this call. 
all the dispatcher could hear was muffled screaming, followed by these sounds that they couldn't quite make out what it was. Then the call was disconnected. So after hearing nothing else on the line, the dispatcher simply hung up, figuring, okay, maybe it was some sort of mistake. Maybe it was some sort of, I don't know, prank call. Then another call came in, just after 1 p.m., but this time, the dispatchers could hear someone, and it was Jordan. And he was calling because he had walked into a scene that was truly ripped out of a nightmare. Like I mentioned earlier, Jordan had also been on campus that morning attending his classes. His last class had ended at 12.55 p.m., and he decided to run home and get a few things done at the apartment. Remember, they didn't live too far from campus, so he got home a little after 1 p.m., when he walked up the stairs and toward the apartment's front door, though, he noticed right away that something was wrong. The lock on their door was broken, and it looked like somebody had used a lot of force to break in. So he went inside, unsure what he was about to discover, and then he headed toward the back of the apartment where the bedroom was. He hadn't made it all the way to their bedroom when he then came across Brittany's body. She was lying on the floor, unresponsive. So he immediately picked up the phone and dialed 911. Because of the massive amount of blood, he told the dispatcher that he thought that Brittany had been shot. While on the phone with the dispatcher, he was instructed to check inside of her mouth and see if maybe anything was obstructing her breathing. That was when he told them that Brittany was cold to the touch. And when he tried to grab her hand to hold it and to comfort her, her fingers were apparently stiff. So police arrived at the scene a couple of minutes later, at 1.08 p.m. Jordan was noticeably shaken up and clearly in shock. He kept crying to the first responders and just saying she was the nicest person ever. Who would do this? Now, he knew that she was dead the moment that he saw her, given the circumstances, but she was officially pronounced dead on the scene at 1.34 p.m. Now, although Jordan mentioned thinking that she had been shot, the first responders quickly realized that that wasn't the case. An official autopsy would have to confirm the manner of death, but it was clear that there had, in fact, been a struggle, and Brittany had been stabbed at least once, if not more. So Jordan was interviewed very quickly, and it was clear to police that he hadn't been involved in any way, shape, or form. When he was asked if any valuables had been taken, like maybe this had been a robbery gone bad, gone wrong, he said he really didn't even have any time to check but the both of their computers were still there, they were out in the open, and those were probably the most expensive things that they both owned. I mean, they were college students, not exactly the kind of people that you would rob. Luckily, the investigators were able to take multiple items into evidence and collect multiple swabs for DNA and fingerprints. Among the things they took as potential evidence were the bloody clothing that Brittany had been wearing, bloody women's slippers, a paper towel with an unknown red substance, a sheet of computer paper with what investigators suspected to be drops of blood, 18 different blood samples, and two sink traps along with their contents, hoping that maybe the killer had tried to clean up the crime scene and wash things away before leaving. They took 23 swabs of DNA and 10 fingerprints as well. They also took nine partial footprints from inside the apartment. Now that sounds like a ton of evidence, right? So surely this case would be solved pretty easily, right? Well, as it turns out, that couldn't be further from the truth. Even though it looked like nothing important had been taken from the apartment, with the door being broken in, investigators still felt like they were looking at some sort of robbery here. There had been a major wave of break-ins in the months and weeks leading up to Brittany's death too, and it was all members of the homeless community. So investigators began looking into some of the homeless men in the area who had some recent run-ins with the law. During the first few weeks of the investigation, the detectives were also keeping pretty tight-lipped about any sort of updates in the case, even for Brittany's family. During that time, the autopsy had come back, and it confirmed that Brittany had died, and I quote, from complex homicidal violence, including multiple stab wounds and strangulation. On top of that, she had been beaten, and nearly half of the stab wounds were to her heart. Now, the big question was, who would have done that, and why? And where was this murderer who was now on the loose? So as you can imagine, word had spread around the town that multiple homeless men had been interviewed, and there were rumors along the lines of, had she been too nice to the homeless? There was a lot of controversy at the time because the city was seen as being more liberal with the homeless community, and they even had some policies to help them out. 
Every day, the Capitol basement had an open-door policy, which gave people access to shelter, even if it was just for a short period of time. And every Sunday, the city hosted free meals for the community, no questions asked. People in the area were conflicted on whether there weren't enough regulations or whether the regulations in place had gone too far. Now, some people argued that the area that Brittany and Jordan lived in was well known for homeless people going door to door during the day. They would be asking for money, sometimes they would just even walk into homes if the doors were unlocked, things like that. It was made very clear by law enforcement that repeat offenders in the homeless community were being looked at, even people without a track record. They believed that Brittany's death had been the result of one of those people coming to her door to ask for money. Just a couple of months before Brittany's murder, another incident had happened in town. And it was eerily, eerily similar to Brittany's murder, which only made the town more uneasy. On January 28th, 31-year-old Joel Marino had been in his home and on the phone with his grandmother. He was wishing her a happy birthday. When the call was cut short. It was cut short by somebody entering his unlocked door and stabbing him to death. Now, Joel had been stabbed twice in the stomach and even attempted to make it to the nearby hospital just yards away before he eventually collapsed in an alley and unfortunately passed away. Police investigated over 175 tips and they combed through over 3,000 mugshots of potential perpetrators and they identified 200 suspects. A $30,000 reward was posted for any information leading to the arrest and conviction of Joel's murderer. But the case was still open, and it was unsolved, this even by the time that Brittany was murdered. Now, that was two separate murders within months of each other. Both people were inside their homes where they thought that they would be the safest when then somebody unexpectedly entered, and then both people were stabbed to death. So was this community looking at a possible serial killer? The fact that investigators wouldn't share much information made people assume the worst. People started locking their doors and carrying weapons like they weren't safe inside their own homes. Not to mention, the previous summer in 2007, another college student named Kelly Nolan had disappeared after a night of bar hopping. Her body was found 16 days later in a wooded area. Investigators believed that she had been kidnapped, taken there, and then killed. By the time of Joel and Brittany's murder, that case was still open and, as you would imagine, also still unsolved. To this day, her family is still searching for answers. So with three unsolved murder cases in under a year, people were beginning to question the abilities of local law enforcement, especially after learning that Brittany had called 911 before or even during her murder. Now we kind of brushed over that part in the story, so let's go into a little more detail about Brittany's call. We know that Brittany was on her computer from 12 to 1218. And then one minute later, at 12.19, she made that 911 call from her cell phone. The 911 dispatcher was a veteran operator who initially told investigators they hadn't heard anything on the other end of the line. They claimed that they had asked repeated questions that all went unanswered. And then when the line went dead, they ended the call. During the first two weeks of the investigation, the operator claimed that they made a callback and that when they did, two men had answered the phone. They said that they had called by accident and they didn't need assistance. Now, apparently, that had been a complete lie. The dispatcher had made a callback, but it was to a different phone number. No callback was ever made to Brittany's phone, and the dispatcher never sent police to investigate, even though the police station was literally blocks away from the apartment. It wasn't until 48 minutes later that the police showed up, and that was only because Jordan had called. The entire community, the media, and Brittany's family and friends were just outraged that the police were never sent to this apartment. They felt like Brittany did all of the correct things that you teach somebody to do from a very young age whenever there's trouble, and yet she was failed in every possible way. Nobody came to help her until it was far too late. The dispatcher had broken policy by not calling her number back, as well as not sending an officer to then follow up and go investigate. But the dispatcher argued that the police only do follow-ups when it's a call from a landline, not a cell phone, which, remember, is what Brittany called from. Now, personally, I don't know how that makes any sense, and I know it was 2008, but to tell the public that they were only going to check up on you if you called from a landline and not a cell phone just kind of seems a little jarring and borderline unprofessional, in my opinion. I don't know. What do you think? If police had been sent during the phone call, Brittany's killer might still have been in the apartment and Brittany might still have been alive. 
Instead, she laid on the floor of her apartment for 48 minutes, and she died alone. And I'm sure she was hoping and praying that any minute now, officers were going to bust through the door, they were going to save her, they got her call, but nothing. Now, what was most controversial about this whole thing was the fact that the authorities seemed to be trying to keep this call covered up. They refused to release the call, saying that it was going to hinder their ongoing investigation if they did. Everybody was pissed, to say the least, because they had to trust and believe that the operator had heard nothing on the call and was just acting in good faith by believing that it was a routine hang-up kind of call, an accident, a mistake. That story was criticized by Joel's parents, who spoke openly about the lack of care in handling both cases. Joel's father told the media, quote, The county and city are more interested in fighting with each other and protecting egos than solving crimes. And Joel's mother emailed the state attorney general and begged him to take over the investigation. Four media outlets ended up filing a lawsuit against the county for refusing to release any information about Brittany's 911 call, also for not releasing information about the call made by her fiancé, and then other related documents. Now, it was clear by this point that somebody was not being completely truthful because there were so many mixed statements on what exactly was heard during the call. The lawsuit hadn't moved any further until a year later in 2009 when all of the documents, except the actual 911 call that Brittany made, were released. However, a transcript of the call was released, and it shows that there had been clear signs of a struggle. It also showed sounds that should have definitely inclined the operator to send help right away. There were um, substantial revelations that came uh, out as a result of this lawsuit, including the fact that the uh, tape uh, did contain sounds of a struggle and screaming. Uh, That was um, brought into the public domain as a result of this lawsuit. Then there seemed to be a hopeful break in the case, possibly. A few months after Brittany's murder, Joel's killer was caught and arrested. He was a 20-year-old University of Wisconsin-Madison dropout named Adam Peterson. He had been flagged as a possible suspect when the Madison Police Department did a review of people with potential mental health issues who had recently contacted the police. See, Adam had contacted them a week before Joel's death on January 20th. He contacted them about somebody stealing his laptop. He then contacted them again shortly after Joel's death, again about his stolen laptop. And the third time was when his roommate contacted the police about doing a wellness check on him. Eventually, investigators filed a warrant to get Adam's DNA, and it came back as a match to the DNA that was found on the knife that was used in Joel's murder. But the question remained, who was Brittany's killer? Detectives announced that they hadn't yet ruled Adam out as a suspect in Brittany's case, but they also warned the media that they had not found any connection between the two cases. Brittany's family still hoped that maybe it would lead them one step closer to finding out who had killed Brittany. Investigators were still conducting interviews all around town, and they were trying to figure out if any witnesses had spotted anyone near Brittany's apartment that day, leading up to it, anything like that. Now, the problem with this is it was easier said than done because, again, there was a lot of foot traffic at the time around the apartment. Lots of homeless people, lots of transients going door to door or just headed to their next location. A lot of different movement. But authorities had also been looking into specific people. The first man was a man named Thomas Cosgrove, who was a 51-year-old homeless man living in the area. Thomas had recently been arrested for carrying a concealed weapon when he and another homeless man were found sleeping in a building on campus. The investigators were so confident about Thomas's involvement that they ended up filing four separate search warrants in connection to him. Two were filed to get surveillance footage from a FedEx store near where he stayed, and then the other two were to obtain articles of clothing and other personal items of his. Now, when Thomas was questioned about Brittany's murder, as well as the crime scene, he told them that he wasn't sure whether or not investigators would find his footprints inside this apartment. And his answer seemed pretty alarming, obviously. Detectives were wondering, uh, what's going on here? The answer would be fairly simple here. What do you mean you don't know? You either were inside the home or you weren't. But despite the search warrants and his very strange answer, Thomas ended up being cleared, and he was determined not to be a suspect in Brittany's murder. So the next man that detectives looked into was a 49-year-old homeless man named Jeffrey Ball. 
Jeffrey had actually been arrested that same day for threatening to stab an employee at a place called the Butler Plaza. This was after he was found sleeping in the women's bathroom. Not only had he made direct threats about stabbing someone, but he had also been found with a bloody knife in his possession. So search warrants were filed to obtain his DNA, also obtain other evidence, but eventually he too was cleared and he was ruled out as a possible suspect as well. The third man was a 53-year-old homeless man named Chauncey Mack. Chauncey had been arrested a few weeks after Brittany's death on May 5, 2008. He was arrested after getting into a fight with another homeless man. A search warrant was filed for his DNA because witnesses claimed that they heard him bragging about being the one who stabbed Brittany, but he denied it and the lead went nowhere. But another name had come up a couple months into the investigation, and that name was David Call. Witnesses had come forward and told detectives that David had been seen in the area. He, too, was a homeless man in the community, and he had a pretty sketchy past and quite a few run-ins with the law. He was a heavy drug user his entire life, he had gotten into trouble for drunk driving multiple times, and he had been convicted of So when David was interviewed by police, he admitted that he had been in the area on the day of Brittany's murder. He said he was scamming local students and also younger people by telling them that he needed $40 for a flat tire, but he was actually using that cash to just go and buy drugs. He told investigators that he had never heard of Brittany and he knew nothing about her murder. All they had were witnesses saying he had been in the area, so his name was kind of just like pushed to the back burner just like all of the others. Then, in December of 2008, an inmate at a prison where David had recently served time told police that David had told him something pretty interesting. He was worried that investigators would find his fingerprints around Brittany's throat, and also on her body. Now, obviously, that was an alarming piece of evidence to hear. But DNA technology back then wasn't like it is today, and investigators hadn't found a match. They had done everything right in terms of getting as much DNA and evidence at the crime scene as possible. And we've seen plenty of cases where things are screwed up from the very beginning, but this, this was different. They had so much to work with, but nothing matched any DNA in the national database. It was like some sort of sick waiting game. So unfortunately, there was going to be a very long road ahead for Britney's family and for their fight for justice. The lack of information on what happened to their daughter didn't end in 2008. In 2010, Jordan filed two separate lawsuits against the authorities who mishandled Britney's 911 call. He argued that their negligence caused him emotional distress after finding his fiancé's body. Unfortunately, a court dismissed Jordan's case, stating that only family members related by blood or marriage would have been able to file that suit, and even though he was a fiancé and they were engaged planning their wedding, legally, he did not qualify or fit the bill. Also in 2010, Brittany's parents, Jean and Kevin, filed two separate lawsuits. The first was against the owners and management of the apartment building where Brittany lived. They were arguing that they violated building codes, which resulted in the killer being able to break in through the front door. The second was against the county, arguing that they mishandled Brittany's 911 call, which ultimately resulted in her death. A settlement was reached against the county, and they agreed to put $5,000 toward the reward to find the killer, and they also were going to put $2,500 to Brittany's parents in legal fees. So with this, both sides agreed not to discuss anything about the lawsuit with the media, and the lawsuit against the apartment building was settled out of court, again with both sides agreeing not to discuss anything with the media. It wasn't until years later, in 2014, that any progress was actually made in Britney's case. So many birthdays had gone by, important holidays, the day that Britney and Jordan were supposed to get married, all without any answers. Each milestone felt like a new wave of grief, and as time went by, Britney's family began to fear that her case was being forgotten. Then, on December 9th, 2014, a new lead suspect was named in the case. This was after the state crime lab reported that they had a DNA hit. The DNA had been taken from Britney's right shirt sleeve, and it had the DNA profile of somebody that investigators had already looked into. The DNA hit matched to David Call. Now, David was already in prison when this information came back, and he was serving time for his seventh drunk driving conviction. The fact that there had been a DNA hit, there, that was good news and that was bad news. Good news because there hadn't been any information in years. 
bad news because the DNA wasn't a strong enough match. It was determined that with the evidence alone, there wouldn't be enough to pursue further legal action. The investigators knew that if they wanted to charge David with something, they were going to need more. The same day that that DNA came back, the detectives on the case also learned that David had been pretty loose-lipped about his crimes while he was in prison, especially with his cellmate, a man named Andrew Scowls. To their surprise, Andrew was willing to snitch on his friend, but of course only if he got something out of it. So two days after learning that Andrew might be able to help, detectives on the case traveled to West Virginia to meet him. He was in federal prison for an illegal gun possession charge. But when they got there, they were immediately annoyed because all Andrew said was that David had confessed to killing Brittany, but he refused to give them any details or any proof that he wasn't lying, that he wasn't bluffing. So this was the beginning of an ongoing fight with Andrew to learn what he knew. Combined with the DNA evidence, it would be enough to arrest David, but first he had to spill. And he said that he would only spill the details of her murder if both of his felony convictions were expunged. His first conviction was a 2010 marijuana charge, but a second conviction was the federal gun conviction in 2014. Meaning that to be expunged, it was going to require a presidential pardon, and that isn't something that can happen overnight. It is an extremely long process, guys. So it was like they were so close to possibly getting justice for Brittany, yet so far away. And when Brittany's family learned about all of it, as you can imagine, they were just devastated, crushed. Jean even emailed Andrew, pleading with him to speak to the police. She learned that Andrew himself had a daughter, and she begged him to consider if Brittany had been his daughter. How would he feel? Wouldn't he do anything to just see that she had justice? But the way that Andrew responded to her, it was truly sickening. No empathy from one parent to another. He didn't back down in the slightest, and he explained to Jean exactly why he wouldn't help until he got what he wanted. He told her that the gun collection that got him his federal charge was, quote, a large part of his life, and that if the conviction got expunged, he could get back the 29 guns that were taken from him. He told Jean that he was a noble man, and then when Jean kind of like clapped back and told him, uh, no, if you were a noble man, you would do the right thing, he replied, I would be willing to cooperate in any and all ways that I could if the government would give me my life back. It is Seriously, so heartbreaking hearing all of this, and I can only imagine how crushed Jean felt that there was nothing that she could say or do to make this monster, this man, change his mind. He's holding the answers. He has the key, and we can't get it. How frustrating that must be. So instead of trying to make a deal with Andrew, police communication with him began to fade, and in 2015, he was paroled. Two years later, in 2017, an unsealed letter between Andrew's attorney to the federal judge was released. The letter stated that the attorney had tried many times to schedule interviews with Andrew and with the investigators, but that nothing ever came of it. It also said that Andrew would now be willing to testify against David for Brittany's murder. It had been almost 10 years since Brittany's murder at this point, with no answers, no justice, However, this development was pretty much ignored too, and it just faded away. Why do you think there hasn't been an arrest or even seemingly like a person of interest or um, a major break in the case? I mean, we, th we thought there was. You know, it was two and a half years ago, Chief Cobalt came to our door on my husband's birthday and said, we believe we have the person responsible for killing your daughter. That's all we have is hope. We can hope. Yeah. But realistically, I'm not real sure that they're ever going to solve this, at least not the way it's being handled right now. I just don't believe it. Now, even if investigators had been planning to do something, Andrew ended up dying in a motorcycle accident in August of 2017, taking all of his information, all of his secrets with him. By that point, investigators were fairly confident that David was the one who had murdered Brittany. He had been in the area that day, and in 2016, he admitted that he had maybe had been in Brittany's apartment the day that she died, but had nothing to do with her murder. I mean, his DNA was found on her shirt. 
His excuse was that any DNA found on her was because of a handshake or a hug when Brittany fell for his scam of needing the $40. So he was admitting to certain things, but still not admitting to her murder. All signs were pointing to David, but again, they just needed something more. David was scheduled to be released for his drunk driving conviction in 2021, which obviously scared the absolute crap out of Brittany's family and law enforcement. If David had a hunch that they were onto him, which I'm sure he did by this point, he could go into hiding, and they may never be able to find him. So they needed to figure something out while he was still in prison, and they needed to figure it out fast. It was now 2020, and the pandemic had started. So to a lot of people, it felt like the world had ended, everything had shut down. For Britney's family, the world as they knew it had ended, but that was many, many years before. But on March 20th, 2020, an arrest was finally made in Britney's case. And the person they arrested was, you guessed it, David. Well, this is an unconventional way to share information, but these are unusual times we're living in. Today's message, though, is not about COVID-19 or any public health orders. It's a message that I hope will bring closure to our community and bring justice to a family. On April 2nd, 2008, almost 12 years ago, Brittany Zimmerman was killed in her downtown Madison apartment. Today I can announce that criminal charges have been filed in her death. David Call, a 53-year-old male, has been charged in Dane County Circuit Court with first-degree intentional homicide as a party to a crime and with a dangerous weapon. Technology had advanced since 2008, and they were able to get that DNA hit from Brittany's shirt, as well as DNA found on her jeans, that matched David's. They had known that they had the killer all along. Unfortunately, they just had to wait for time to pass to get more evidence and connect him to the murder. So after being arrested, David finally confessed to everything that happened that day. He told investigators that on the day of Brittany's murder, he had been going door to door looking for more money so he could go get high, despite already apparently being incredibly high. Similar to his earlier accounts, he had been telling people that he needed $40 to fix a flat tire. Most people turned him down, though, and on one occasion, he walked right into the home of a woman who had left her door unlocked, but when she told him that he needed to leave, he did so without an argument or any type of altercation or fight. And I can't help but wonder if that woman looks back and realizes how close she came to being murdered that day. So after going around town for a few hours with no luck, he decided that when he saw Brittany's apartment building, he was going to break in, and he was hoping that since the door was locked, nobody was home. Of course, we now know that that unfortunately wasn't the case, because when he got inside, Brittany was there. And initially, things hadn't gone south right away. David claimed that it had never been his intention to hurt Brittany. He just wanted money. Apparently, Brittany told him she didn't have any money to give him. He said he intended to leave, just like he had at that other woman's house. But then he decided to ask if he could use the bathroom first. Now, some people would say that Brittany agreed to let him use the bathroom because that's the kind of person she was, kind and empathetic at all times. But I think that Brittany agreed to let him use the bathroom because she knew it would buy her time to get away from the situation and get help. She was smart, and like I mentioned earlier, very, very safety conscious. Unfortunately, when David got out of the bathroom, he caught Brittany on her cell phone calling somebody, presumably 911. He said that it was at that very moment when he noticed she was calling 911 that he snapped. He knew that Brittany was trying to call 911 and he was not about to go to jail for breaking into her apartment. He had already had his fair share of prison and he was not about to go back according to him. So he said he ran up to Brittany, got behind her, and knocked the phone out of her hand and onto the floor. That's why the operator got no answer. Brittany had literally been fighting for her life. She didn't exactly have time to chat on the phone with the operator. Brittany had done all of the right things and was on the phone with 911 when she was being attacked, yet nobody ever came to help her. After throwing her phone to the ground, David dragged her into the bedroom, where he then threw her on the bed, grabbed one of her t-shirts nearby, and began strangling her. Now, I'm thinking that Brittany had probably lost consciousness by then because David said that she wasn't moving but he noticed that she was still breathing. So that's when he decided he was gonna go into the kitchen, he grabbed that knife from that butcher's block, and he began stabbing Brittany to make sure that she truly would be dead by the time that he left. Now remember, we said earlier that Jordan found Brittany's body while he was walking to the bedroom. 
leading me to believe that she was either in the doorway or in the hallway. David's confession said that he left her on the bed. So if Jordan really found her outside of the bedroom, I'm wondering if maybe Brittany had regained consciousness after David left and she was trying everything she could do to get to the phone or out of the house. Which again makes me believe and so frustrated that if law enforcement had been sent to her apartment, they might have had a chance to save her. David initially pleaded not guilty and his trial was set for January 2023. After what his lawyer called a lot of soul searching, David ultimately decided to plead guilty as part of a plea deal. The deal was that if David pled guilty, the state wouldn't contest a petition for extended supervision after serving 20 years of his sentence. David and his lawyers were fine with that deal because by then, David had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. His lawyers even requested that he be sentenced to life as soon as possible so that he could be transferred to a place that would treat his mental illness. The diagnosis was never an issue with sentencing or conviction because a judge had already ruled him to be competent. I would like to apologize to everybody, especially the Zimmerman family. I took away Brittany's 21-year-old life, a uh, family that she could have had. Now, there are many things about this case that are just kind of mind-blowing to me. It's mind-blowing that it took so many years to find Brittany's killer, and that had he been released from prison without the DNA connecting him to the case, David could very easily have gotten away with it, and he could have taken Brittany's story to his grave. I don't think I need to even mention the entire 911 call and that epic failure and how scary that is to think about. It's horrible. I also mentioned earlier that college student who had been murdered the summer before Brittany, Kelly Nolan. Now, David never confessed to her murder, and nothing was ever found to connect him to the case. But her family is still searching for answers and fighting for justice to this day. Brittany would have likely been a doctor by now. Her family has no doubt that she would have been married and filled the house with a bunch of kids and cats, which were her favorite pet. Her mother says all that she could think about during the pandemic was that Brittany would have been such a huge help because COVID-19 was exactly the type of disease that Brittany was passionate about curing. Let's see what this one is. Of a beloved daughter who had a lifetime ahead of her. These are probably some of the last pictures that we have of her. This was actually probably when she was born. This is when I had Harriet. Yeah, yes, it is, yeah. That's her and her little brother. That's Matthew. And I keep thinking back to that phone call that Brittany made to her mom just before everything went down. I can only imagine how heartbreaking it was for Jean knowing that her daughter died probably just 30 minutes after trying to call her. Maybe they would have chatted for a few minutes and the outcome would have been the same and maybe nothing could have changed what happened that day, but I'm sure it's still upsetting to know that you didn't have that final call with her. And it really does, at least for me, it makes you want to call the people that you love and just tell them how much you love them, how much you care about them, because it's truly, it's so cliche, but it's so true. You never know when you are going to lose somebody. And you never know when your time's going to be up. It's a really scary thought to think about. Just that morning, Brittany had been so happy, so full of life, stressing about things that really wouldn't matter at all just hours later. It's crazy to think about the chain of events that lead a person to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And it's sad to imagine what could have been, and if she had just studied with her friend at the campus library, or maybe had a class at noon or had gone out to lunch, she and Jordan would have both been out of the apartment, out of harm's way, safe, and alive. I also wish that justice could have been served sooner. But at least now her family can rest, knowing that her killer will never walk the streets again and can never hurt somebody the way that he hurt their family that day in April. It is so haunting to think about. If you ever have a chance to have a daughter, you would want her to be Brittany because she was an amazing, amazing daughter. Brittany was just denied so many things that were so incredibly important to her. You know, she doesn't ever get to have children. She didn't get to have her wedding. She didn't even get to see the graduation that she worked so mm -hmm. hard for. I truly don't think there will ever be a day where we don't cry, that we miss her so much. I, I don't think we'll ever get over this. I, I truly don't. Thank you so much for listening to Brittany's story today. Please text your loved ones, call your loved ones, stay safe, lock your doors, and just be hyper aware about everything in your surroundings. All right, guys, until the next case, stay safe.